what is missing cannot be recovered. So I feel like as we're reading these verses or quotes from Solomon, I hear some cynicism in these verses. But the good news is it doesn't end there. It doesn't end in the depths of his despondency or his groanings. He also writes seven times in one form or another, remember your creator, remember your creator. And the final statement in his book, let's just go there, it's Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And he says, here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his command. For this is everyone's duty. What does duty mean? It means all, everything, whole, entirety. What does the word say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's the same. We have to fear God. We have to obey his commands with everything in wholeness and in its entirety. And that's what I want to talk about today. It's a virtue that can literally change your life, and it's called the fear of the Lord. Now, I've talked about this experience before. It's very personal to me, so the fact that I'm sharing it with you means you're special. <laughs> but I had to reshare it because this is a timely now word. And about a year and a half ago, I was in the office with a young lady counseling and giving her advice. And I began to talk about Abraham and how he couldn't even see where he was going. He had such faith that he just heard the voice of the Lord. And he obeyed the voice of the Lord and went when God said go. And immediately as I said that, I guess it would be over her left shoulder, I saw this spark of light in the room, physically. And I just knew in my spirit that there was an angel in the room. I didn't see it form, but I saw the spark of light. And we both just looked at each other with such a shock and frightened look, okay? We could feel its presence. And I'm just gonna read Luke 1, 28 through 30, don't have to go there, but it says, and coming in, he said in her greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So this was the announcement that the angel gave to Mary that she would birth Jesus into the world. And I'm interjecting this verse because the angel has a reason that he said, Do not be afraid. Have you really read the description of the angels in the Bible? Some of them have many eyes. Some of them are wheels within wheels. Some of them have four heads and ox and human and so on. Some have many sets of wings. And when they say holy, 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 the Bible says that the pillars of heaven yes. shake. Yes. And some people Thank said you. that billions of souls could fit in the throne. I don't know how they know that, but I believe it. And so when the pillars shake, that's something to think about. And now when Gabriel appeared in Mary, I don't imagine that he looks that way. I don't know what his true form is, but to me, their presence alone commands attention. And so me and her looked at each other. All I could do was freeze. It was like the most terrifying, yet the most delightful thing that I could be in, and I related to a trance. You know, those are in the Bible, they're in the New Testament. And my, I literally could not move a muscle for a long time. I was just frozen with my hands in the air, worshiping the Lord. I couldn't move. And all I thought about was this verse in Hebrews, if you'd like to go there, you can't. It's 1031, Hebrews 1031. Thank you, Lord. And as I began to have this um, experience, I could just think, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. I felt like I was in his hands and I was just so small. I felt like the whole world could sit in his hands. And as we sat in there, I went to eternity. And I can't explain eternity to you, but God is eternal. Thank you, Lord. And the word says, behold the kindness and the severity of God. I think we need to stay balanced or we can get off course. We talk a lot about grace and we are in grace. That's true. But this verse is in the New Testament in Hebrews. And I felt the fear of the Lord like I had never felt it before that or since that day. And it was so wonderful, but it was so terrifying because I got a glimpse of him I had never seen before. And I want to talk about fear. For years, people have strived to eradicate it and say fear is not good at all. President Franklin D. Roosevelt even called attention to it. And he says the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We see voices across all platforms saying that we need to overcome fear. Hundreds of thousands of self-help books designed to do exactly that. And even I remember when I was younger, I don't know if they still make it, but they'd have no fear written on shirts, okay? So we're pretty adamant about eliminating all fear from our lives, and it seems sensible, right? But we have to ask ourselves, is all fear actually bad? 
And I think the issue is we lump all fears into one category as harmful. But is that assumption accurate? What do you think? So I think we need to acknowledge some destructive fears. And these are things that I just thought about. Um, I really didn't know what this was called. I should have. But aerophobia. It's where you're so afraid to fly that you're literally never, I don't care how far you have to go, you're not going to get on an airplane. Because you think something's going to happen. And that's true. Things do happen. But here's the reality. You're less likely to have something happen on a plane than in a vehicle. That's just the reality of it. And I thought, what if God calls you to another nation to minister? Are you going to let that fear hold you back? You see, that's the issue. When fear trumps our obedience. Okay? Are you going to obey? What about relationships? Um, sometimes we hold our spouse so tightly that they can't even breathe and be themselves. We're so afraid of losing them that we try to control them. And I have to ask, is that love? No, that's not love. We're walking in fear because we're trying to control an outcome of a circumstance and a person. What about the fear of future? We get so wrapped up sometimes in the future that hasn't even happened yet. Like, what could happen? Uh, our minds go to what if, what if, what if. Has your mind ever done that? Because I know mine has. What if this happens? What if that happens? And, and our imagination just runs wild in the worst case scenario. goes through our mind. But what if we think about the best? Why don't we think about that? Yeah. And so to me, there's just, uh, those are a few destructive fears that I thought of out of many. And I'd like to add that fear can really paralyze you in the wrong way and cause anxiety. Before we became pastors, probably for about a year before, I was getting attacked so badly. And, and some of it was food. It's, it's a mixture of things. But I was having panic attacks every day, sometimes twice a day for a year straight. And they are horrible. And they are real. But this is what the enemy will try to do. And it affects everything. It affects your mind. It affects your body, OK? But on the other hand, constructive fear or caution can produce beneficial wisdom, okay? What are some constructive fears? I'll talk about snakes. <laughs> a couple of years ago, we went to Tennessee, and we were up in the mountains, and it was beautiful. And then all of a sudden, we're walking on the trail. There's people behind us. There's people before us. You know, there's the cliff. And this snake comes out of the cliff to us out of nowhere, in midair, out of the cliff. <laughs> and constructive fear says don't touch it because my son would probably know what kind of it is. He's an animal expert, but I don't know. And so the constructive fear is my brain's way of saying, hold back, keep me safe. Um, you remember Steve Irwin. He had no fear of animals and he ended up getting into the stingrays and he got stung and he passed away. And I thought, what if he would have, I'm sure he knew about them, but what if he would have had a healthy fear or caution? Would he still be here with us today? Sometimes we think we're invincible. Oh, another relevant constructive caution or fear is everything going on with trafficking today and wild things with children. I think we need to keep an eye on our children now more than ever. But we don't want fear to control us to the point that they can't even live. They can't even play outside. We just have to be with them. And so I thought about those constructive and destructive fears, but the real question we should be asking is, what do we fear the most? Or better yet, who do we fear the most? And it's a very wise question. And if properly answered, it's going to put all of your other fears into perspective. And it can enhance your life now and for eternity. Holy fear's importance will trump all other fears we may have. Scripture identifies it as Jesus' delight. Let's go to Isaiah 11.3. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. So Jesus' delight is in the holy fear of the Lord. And as I read that verse, if it's his delight, how much more should it be our delight too? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Even more amazing, in Isaiah 33, 6, it says, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. So it's God's treasure. Well, let's just ponder this for a moment. Holy fear is God Almighty's delight and his treasure. If that's the case, then it has to be ours too. I really think Solomon didn't fully realize the value of godly fear, even though he was teaching it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So prior to his fall, he wasn't, uh, godly fear wasn't his treasure. Or his delight, so it was easy to draw him away. Plus, he had so many wives, and they worshipped pagan idols, and so that drew him away, too. 
But I am stumbling, inexperiencing folly, and finally recovering, he more fully grasped the magnitude of its power. Holy fear is God's treasure, bottom line, and so it should also be ours. And as I got to thinking about this, you know, as you get older, you think about things a little bit differently. It's just humbling to think that everybody that we see now in 100 years most likely won't be here on this earth. That's very sobering. Uh, it's so green to me as I looked out in my backyard and to realize that some trees are probably going to outlive me on this earth if the Lord doesn't come first. It's very sobering. And we can have nice things for sure, but it's the hidden treasures like the fear of the Lord that's going to last for now and eternity. That cannot be taken away from you. It cannot be taken away. Those are eternal treasures. And so I really think we need to invest in those. Um... I want to talk about some common counteractions. Like some preachers might say, well, see 2 Timothy 1.7, and it says the fear of the Lord, uh, you know, say it only applies to Old Testament times, but as Christians, we've not been given the fear of fear. John 4.18, we're told again in the New Testament, there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. And so for sure, for sure those scriptures are true. But it's talking about the unhealthy fear I talked about earlier, letting it control you, letting it paralyze you. And God didn't give us that kind of fear. But I want us to go to the New Testament. I want us to go to Philippians 2.12. Because New Testament writers also pen these verses. And it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what I think? I think sometimes we're so worried about the walk of others. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have concern. We are our brother's keeper. But sometimes we're so focused on them and what they're doing that we're not working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Like, how, how often are we aware of his omnipresence as we go about our day? He's beholding the good and the evil in every detail of your life. Are we having the character we should, trembling at the thought that he is El Roy? Do you know what that means? It means the God who sees me. He knows the intentions of our heart and our thoughts before we even think of them. So how are we working out our own salvation? Is it with this fear and trembling that Philippians is talking about? And what about 2 Corinthians 7 1? Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It says we have to cleanse our mind today. Like how do we do that from the filth that's around us? Sometimes stuff's thrown at us that we didn't even expect, you know? But it says that we have to cleanse ourselves and it's by renewing our minds daily to conform it to the word. Let me tell you something. His ways are way different than the world's ways. The way God thinks is way different than what the world tells us. It's like a complete four opposites. And it ends as perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's how we're perfected. One more verse in Hebrews 12, 28. Let us have grace at which we may serve God acceptably. With reverence and godly fear. So it's saying the only acceptable way to even serve the Lord is with reverence. And reverence means having deep respect for someone or something. And having godly fear. Not the devilish kind of fear that causes us torment. But godly fear. So we can see that this is a New Testament truth too. So we don't want to confuse the spirit of fear with the fear of the Lord. They're two vastly different fears. And I want to say that it's also a spirit. So in Isaiah 11, 2, it says, The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So this was a sevenfold spirit that rested upon Jesus the Christ, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Okay, so it's a spirit too. Um, I want us to turn, if you could, all to Exodus 19, 3 through 4. I want to go back to Moses and the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. It's Exodus 19, 3 through 4. And it says, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. It is just so special. It's such a special image. The chief reason for God's mighty deliverance was to gather the people to himself. And he bore them on eagles' wings and he delivered them. What a picture. Just get that in your mind. He longed for them. He desired them to meet with them. It wasn't just for Moses. It was for everybody. And so three days later, God came down the mountain and introduced himself. But guess what the people did? This is Exodus 20, 19. 
In terror, they cried out to Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Okay, I get it. After my experience in the office, I felt the same way. I felt like I could die right then and there. So I get it. But God brought them to himself. But the children of, uh, of Israel withdrew themselves. And they just wanted to hear what God had to say through Moses. If we go forward to Exodus 20, 20, it says, Do not fear, for God has come to test you. And that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So it kind of seems there like Moses is contradicting himself, right? Like he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Do not fear, because God has come to test you. That his fear may be before you. Okay, Moses wasn't speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He's differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. And here's the big difference. It's a huge difference. So being scared of God often means you have something to hide. I'm going to go back to the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They hid from the voice and presence of the Lord. And they, they tried covering themselves up. But that is not unique just to them, guys. It's all throughout scripture, and even now we have similar behavior. Like when we're in sin, or when we're on the edge of darkness, you know, light scatters darkness. It's no different for us. But the difference is the person who fears God with holy fear, they have nothing to hide. Remember before they sinned, they were both naked and bare before him? So when you have holy fear, you have nothing to hide. Actually, you're terrified of being away from God. They're terrified of distance between them and God. And it's illustrated by the fact that simultaneously, as they're drawn back, Moses is simultaneously drawn near. And he's going up the mountain to speak with God. And I thought about it. The person who truly fears God doesn't say, well, let me see. How close can I get to this line? How close can I get to the edge and not fall into sin? No, it should be the opposite. Thank you, Lord. It's if we should say, I want to be so close to God and so far away from that line that I can't even see that line. Let's go to Psalm 2514. I love this one. It says, the Lord is a friend to those who fear him. I don't know about you, but who all wants to be a friend of God? I want to be known as a friend of God. He's a friend to those who fear him. And the reality is this. He wants that intimacy with you. It's what he's wanted with us all along from the very beginning. Fellowship. We talk about partnership here. Intimacy. Who's he coming back for? He's coming back for his bride. That's intimacy. So this holy fear is not going to quench that intimacy. It's going to do the opposite. It's actually going to enhance your encounters with God. You know, we can never define this in a single lesson, but we're going to continue to grow in this if we accept it all throughout eternity. Um, some even say that the fear of God is to reverentially worship him. And I believe that's true. Um, okay, I'm going to tell myself. So have you ever um, been at a table with somebody... I've had it happen to me, and I love it. <laughs> and they're just on their cell phones the whole entire time. <laughs> uh, guilty sometimes. <laughs> um, but how does that make you feel? They're present physically, but their heart is not there. They're not giving you their full attention, their undivided attention. And let's think about a king. When they enter a room, an earthly king, they announce the king's name. Everyone stands up, and there's much reverence given. Okay. Even David said, you know, if he makes his bed in uh, the grave or hell, God would still be there. Like, God's been holding all things. He's omnipresent. But I want to tell you, manifest presence is a lot different than omnipresence. It's like that time in the office when he manifested in a different way I had never seen before. So he's always present. But the manifest presence doesn't seem to always be there. Um, and I just thought about it. I thought, how does he feel? If we're not reverentially worshiping him, when we're not giving him our full worship, we're not giving him our undivided attention, we're not engaging fully, or we're complaining, and we all do it, okay? This message is to me first. But it's like sitting at that table and not paying attention to who's before you. And we're talking about the king of kings. Now, I'm not going to leave it there and say that that's all the fear of the Lord is just reverence alone. Uh, Hebrews 12, 28 through 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. 
that gets me a consuming fire, like a fire that never goes out, that burns out and consumes everything in it that's not of him. But if you look closely, there's two terms, and it says reverence and godly fear. So that shows us there's a difference there, okay? One of Merriam-Webster's dictionary definitions is of reverence is profound, adoring, awed, respect. Thank you, Lord. Godly fear carries the meaning of all. For all definition, it says fear, dread, inspired by something great and terrific, to strike with fear and reverence, to influence by fear, terror, or respect. That could, that could uh, disturb or alarm some people when you hear dread and terror, but remember, this holy fear is going to draw you in. It's not repulsive. Okay, so while I had that experience in the office, I was being drawn closer, drawn closer in all of my creator. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you to mentally keep some statements about holy fear. Um, and if need be, I can even um, send some notes to Dawn. But to fear God is the reverence and being complete all of him. To fear God is to esteem, respect, honor, venerate, and adore him above anyone or anything else. We love what he loves, and we hate what he hates. Amen. This is important to him be, uh, and to us, and vice versa. To fear God is to hate all manner of evil, sin, and injustice. I'm not talking about people, guys, but I'm talking about evil, sin, and injustice, okay? You know why God hates that? Because it separates us from him, and he is love, and he is all that's good, and he hates that. He hates when we're separated from him. To fear God is to depart from evil in every sense. That means our thoughts, our words, and our actions. It's a battle sometimes, isn't it? Because the enemy comes, and like Joyce Meyer said, the battlefield of the mind. That's where it starts. But if we keep letting it fester and go on, and we're not departing from people and bringing those strongholds down, then guess what? Sometimes it becomes words. And then after it becomes words, it becomes our actions. And then it becomes our life. Thank you, Lord. To fear God is to give him the praise, adoration, thanksgiving, and worship he deserves. He deserves it. To fear God is to give him all that belongs to him. And guess what? All belongs to him, even your brother. To fear God is to tremble before him in wonder and awe. To give his word and presence our full, undivided attention. The fear of God is to obey him, not just the desire. But there's an inward force determined to carry out his will no matter the cost. What did Jesus do? It may not have made sense, but he immediately obeyed. He may not have, you know, I think he fully understood it, but, you know, I know the disciples did it. Um, but yet he carried it out to completion. Even going to the cross, are we willing? What's our cost? What's our cross? To fear God is to shun any form of complaining, murmuring, or grumbling. Ouch. <laughs> That's a hard one. That is a hard one. Thank you. Uh, but the children of Israel, a lot of them never made it to the promised land because they kept grumbling. They kept complaining. <laughs> so fearing God, we're shunning that. Thank you, Jesus. To fear God is to respect, honor, and submit to his direct and delegated authority. It also obeys the delegated authority, with the only exception being if they tell us the sins. So I want to expand on that. So if you have ungodly leaders who are abusing their authority, by all means, take your stand, okay? You're not a doormat. But if you have godly leaders, I didn't say perfect leaders, I said godly leaders, we're to honor one another. Thank you, Lord. I feel like, and I'm not trying to judge because my walk of the curve, but I feel like I can tell a lot about someone's true relationship with the Lord if they don't honor other people. And you might say, well, why do I say that? Well, I say that because Scripture says, how can you say you love God when you haven't even seen? You don't even love those you can see. Yeah. And I know we're talking about honor, but I feel like honor and love, they go hand in hand in respecting others. Why? Because you are all made in his image. Okay? Amen. The fear of the Lord shapes our intentions, thoughts, words, and actions. If it's not, if the Holy Fear is not shaping that, then guess what? We're living however we want to live, however we want to choose, and we're doing what's right in our own eyes, like what we think is good or evil. And should we be the judge of that? No. All right. I just want you to know that's a lot. But everything is attainable and beneficial for you and me that I just spoke about. And why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the helper who lives with inside of us. And this treasure gift that he's made available is to protect us. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. More benefits of holy fear. The fear of the Lord is the starting place for an intimate relationship with God. We become his friends, and we learn about that in Psalm. 
and his secrets are made known to us. Do you want to know God's secrets? Because secrets are only told to who? Your closest companion. I'm not going to tell my secrets to just anybody, but I will tell them to my closest companion, the people that I trust. Well, God's only going to tell his secrets to those he can trust. And the Spirit searches all things. He asks even the deep things of God. So he knows everything. And I'm just so excited to learn more about his secrets. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So it's going to give foresight and clear direction. Who in here needs wisdom for your home life and your relationships? Me? Who needs wisdom for what college or job to apply for? Me. Who needs more wisdom on how to raise their kids? Me. <laughs> okay, we all do. We all do. And that's what uh, the knowledge of the Holy One is going to do. The fear of the Lord is how we mature our salvation and are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Like, isn't that our main goal, to conform to his image? Like, he's at the right hand of the Father now, but we're down here now. And it's our turn to look like him. It's our turn to walk like him in the earth. I love this one. The fear of the Lord is clean. It produces true holiness in our lives. That's Psalm 19.9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Like, I thought about this summer and how I was out laying mulch. I got up on the roof of the facility. It was like 90 degrees that day. I felt 20 degrees hotter up there. But I worked for days and days in the garden and getting the mulch down. And I got in the shower, and it just was so refreshing. It made me feel completely like new. And I just, that's what it reminded me of with this verse. Like, the Lord makes us clean. It's refreshing. The fear of the Lord is literally, as I've been studying this, I have felt so refreshed. And that's because why it makes us holy. And holiness is pure. We aren't defiled. To abide in the fear of the Lord is to secure an eternal legacy. I want a legacy for my children, for my grandchildren. And I want to be known in heaven. The fear of the Lord produces confidence, fearlessness, and security. It swallows up all other fears, including the fear of man. Boy, we deal with that one a lot, don't we? Fear of man. So when we fear the greatest who is God, guess what? All other fears become minuscule. It's like, it's like how I was sitting in his giant hands and I felt so tiny. Like The fear of him is going to swallow every other fear that we might have up, okay? The fear of the Lord provides angelic assistance. Fulfilled desires, enduring success, influence, longevity, productive days, enjoyment in life, happiness, pleasure and labor, healing for our bodies, and so much more. Like, isn't this great to know that there's all these benefits when we choose to walk in the fear of the Lord? Mm -hmm. I just want to remind you, it's not being scared of God and withdrawing away, but it's, it's to be terrified of being away from him because he's the source for everything. And guys... There's a way that God wants to be loved. Just like there's ways we all want to be loved. They talk about the love languages. I don't know about all that. They say active service, presence, time spent. Um, there's loving things we want to hear, right? And there's ways that we want to be loved. Well, God has ways that he wants to be loved, too. And I began my prayers in the morning even differently. Like, I don't want to just start asking for things and having my wants, but I just started with, oh, Jesus, you're regal. Oh, Jesus, you're at the right hand, high and lifted up. You're the king of kings, priest of priests, lord of lords, the only God. And, you know, I began to sense his pleasure over me as I did that. And think about it. Jesus told us that. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's how he said the Lord's Prayer was to start. So that means holy. And so it's very simple how he wants us to pray. We don't need to complicate it with vain and empty words. Just begin to tell him how holy he is, how wonderful he is to you, how much uh, you love him. And I love this quote from Joy Dawson. She said, when we see him face to face in all his awesome holiness and blazing glory, it will seem incredible to us that we ever had a casual thought in relation to him. You see, we get comfortable. We get familiar with people that we know, but we can't get casual about God. He's our friend, but he's still God Almighty. Psalm 145, he says, Great is that in I, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is beyond all searching out. His greatness is beyond all searching out. There's no comparison. There's no limits to him. Yet we still search for him, still increase our intimacy and knowledge of him, although we're never going to exhaust it. 
And I want to talk about Isaiah. He said, when I saw the Lord, I lifted up. You hear the seraphim saying, holy, holy, holy. So Hebrew writers would often, you know, we italicize words to emphasize them, and they would do that twice. Here they're doing it three times. So this is the utmost emphasis on the word holy when they were acting to his many facets. He has many facets as they're swirling around his throne. Above him, they're seeing the many different facets that can never be exhausted. Something new every time. I'll just go there, Isaiah 6, 5. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Like, we're talking about Isaiah, God's prophet, who penned the scriptures. He corrects others. He's consecrated. And yet, when he saw the Lord in his holiness, he said, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Job 42.5, God says of him, of Job, he's the finest man in all the earth. Yet when Job saw him, he said, I abhor myself. Ezekiel 128, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. This is men that wrote the Bible. And when they saw, they fell in their face. Abraham, in Genesis 17, 3, God said, Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make covenant with you. He's the father of our faith. faith. And there he even fell face forward. When I caught sight of him, I fell down at his feet as though dead. He touched me with his right hand and said, Don't fear. I'm the first and the last, the one who lives. And that's from Revelation 1, 17. This is John. This is the one who laid his head on Jesus' chest, the beloved disciple, while he walked on earth. But we're not talking about that anymore. He fell out dead when he saw Jesus in his glorified state. We're talking about the resurrected Lord and his Father and all the glory. And guess what? He's coming back on a white horse, not coming back in the mood of this time. And his eyes are aflame. Thank you, Jesus. I want to leave you with Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Let me ask you again, do you want to know him more intimately? Well, guess what? The fear of the Lord is going to have to be there. And I'm not talking about walking on eggshells or legalism, but I'm talking about being bathed in intimacy with reverential awe of him, because how can you not be? It's like we're pliable, we're yield to him. We say, have your will, have your way. We don't lose our wonder. We don't become casual about him. No casual talks, but we're always beholding his face. And what he told me, I've been talking about revival for a lot of years, but I believe that this is a prerequisite for the revival we've been talking about. It's the fear of the Lord is going to have to return, not just to our church, but the body of Christ as a whole. And so I would like for us to just all stand. And, and I do want to say while I'm looking at you, Jim, thank you for going forth this morning. In spite of all the challenges, I appreciate the praise team. But thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for your word. This wasn't Brooke's word. But I just release the spirit of the fear of the Lord in this place this morning. Father, there's a song I've been listening to that says, the praise is a perfume, I'll lavish it on you. So I just want you guys to just start lavishing your love on him right now. Because he wants to be loved, and he wants our full attention. And so Jesus, we just worship you. We just stand in reverential all of you. You are almighty God. You are almighty creator. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And Lord, I know if we see you someday, oh man, there's nothing that can even come close or compare to you. And sometimes, Lord, it's hard because we are made of clay too on this earth. But Lord, help us if we haven't had these kind of experiences to have these experiences. Manifest, Lord, your presence in the lives of the people, Lord. We just release dreams right now. I pray, Father God, that you'll just visit them with dreams, Lord. Let them have the experiences, Lord, like we had in the office, Lord. You don't pick favorites, God. You said you pour out your spirit on all flesh, God. And so I pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on your people, that they will just begin to know you in a much deeper, deeper way. As Sister Stacy said, Lord, we're just dying.
diving in and we're going down into the deep depths. Things we've never known, Lord. As we look to you, Jesus, you're our focus. You're our focus, Lord. Thank you. 